the future of India. This is the ancient land where wisdom made its home before it went into any other country, the same India whose influx of spirituality is represented, as it were, on the material plane, by rolling rivers like oceans, where the eternal Himalayas, rising tier above tier with their snowcaps, look as it were into the very mysteries of heaven. Here is the same India whose soil has been trodden by the feet of the greatest sages that ever lived. Here first sprang up inquiries into the nature of man and into the internal world. Here first arose the doctrines of the immortality of the soul, the existence of a supervising God, an immanent God in nature and in man, and here the highest ideals of religion and philosophy have attained their culminating points. This is the land from whence, like the tidal waves, spirituality and philosophy have again and again rushed out and deluged the world, and this is the land from whence once more such tides must proceed in order to bring life and vigour into the decaying races of mankind. It is the same India which has withstood the shocks of centuries, of hundreds of foreign invasions of hundreds of upheavals of manners and customs. It is the same land which stands firmer than any rock in the world, with its undying vigour, indestructible life. Its life is of the same nature as the soul, without beginning and without end, immortal, and we are the children of such a country, children of India. I am here to speak to you today about some practical things and my object in reminding you about the glories of the past is simply this. Many times have I been told that looking into the past only degenerates and leads to nothing and that we should look to the future. That is true. But out of the past is built the future. Look back, therefore, as far as you can, Drink deep of the eternal fountains that are behind, and after that, look forward, march forward and make India brighter, greater, much higher than she ever was. Our ancestors were great. We must first recall that. We must learn the elements of our being, the blood that courses in our veins, we must have faith in that blood and what it did in the past, and out of that faith and consciousness of past greatness, we must build an India yet greater than what she has been. There have been periods of decay and degradation. I do not attach much importance to them, we all know that. Such periods have been necessary. A mighty tree produces a beautiful ripe fruit. That fruit falls on the ground, it decays and rots, and out of that decay springs the root and the future tree, perhaps mightier than the first one. This period of decay through which we have passed was all the more necessary. Out of this decay is coming the India of the future, it is sprouting, its first leaves are already out, and a mighty, gigantic tree, the Urdhvamula, is here, already beginning to appear, and it is about that that I am going to speak to you. The problems in India are more complicated, more momentous, than the problems in any other country. Race, religion, language, government, all these together make a nation. The elements which compose the nations of the world are indeed very few, taking race after race, compared to this country. Here have been the Aryan, the Dravidian, the Tartar, the Turk, the Mughal, the European, all the nations of the world as it were, pouring their blood into this land. Of languages the most wonderful conglomeration is here, of manners and customs there is more difference between two Indian races than between the European and the Eastern races. The one common ground that we have is our sacred tradition, our religion. That is the only common ground, and upon that we shall have to build. In Europe, Political ideas form the national unity. In Asia, religious ideals form the national unity. The unity in religion, therefore, is absolutely necessary as the first condition of the future of India. There must be the recognition of one religion throughout the length and breadth of this land. 
What do I mean by one religion? Not in the sense of one religion as held among the Christians or the Mohammedans of the Buddhists. We know that our religion has certain common grounds, common to all our sects, however varying their conclusions may be, however different their claims may be. So there are certain common grounds, and within their limitation this religion of ours admits of a marvelous variation, an infinite amount of liberty to think and live our own lives. We all know that, at least those of us who have thought, and what we want is to bring out these life-giving common principles of our religion, and let every man, woman and child, throughout the length and breadth of this country, understand them, know them and try to bring them out in their lives. This is the first step and, therefore, it has to be taken. We see how in Asia and especially in India, race difficulties, linguistic difficulties, social difficulties, national difficulties, all melt away before this unifying power of religion. We know that to the Indian mind there is nothing higher than religious ideals, that this is the keynote of Indian life, and we can only work in the line of least resistance. It is not only true that the ideal of religion is the highest ideal, in the case of India it is the only possible means of work, work in any other line, without first strengthening this, would be disastrous. Therefore the first plank in the making of a future India, the first step that is to be hewn out of that rock of ages, is this unification of religion. All of us have to be taught that we Hindus, dualists, qualified monists, or monists, Shaivas, Vaishnavas, or Pashuktas, to whatever denomination we may belong, have certain common ideas behind us, and that the time has come when for the well-being of ourselves, for the well-being of our race, we must give up all our little quarrels and differences. Be sure, these quarrels are entirely wrong, they are condemned by our scriptures, forbidden by our forefathers, and those great men from whom we claim our descent, whose blood is in our veins, look down with contempt on their children quarreling about minute differences. With the giving up of quarrels all other improvements will come. When the lifeblood is strong and pure, no disease germ can live in that body. Our lifeblood is spirituality. If it flows clear, if it flows strong and pure and vigorous, everything is right, political, social, any other material defects, even the poverty of the land, will all be cured if that blood is pure. For if the disease germ be thrown out, nothing will be able to enter into the blood. To take a simile from modern medicine, we know that there must be two causes to produce a disease, some poison germ outside, and the state of the body. Until the body is in a state to admit the germs, until the body is degraded to a lower vitality so that the germs may enter and thrive and multiply, there is no power in any germ in the world to produce a disease in the body. In fact, millions of germs are continually passing through everyone's body, but so long as it is vigorous, it never is conscious of them. It is only when the body is weak that these germs take possession of it and produce disease. Just so with the national life. It is when the national body is weak that all sorts of disease germs, in the political state of the race or in its social state, in its educational or intellectual state, crowd into the system and produce disease. To remedy it, therefore, we must go to the root of this disease and cleanse the blood of all impurities. The one tendency will be to strengthen the man, to make the blood pure, the body vigorous, so that it will be able to resist and throw off all external poisons. We have seen that our vigor, our strength, nay, our national life is in our religion. I am not going to discuss now whether it is right or not, whether it is correct or not, whether it is beneficial or not in the long run to have this vitality in religion, but for good or evil it is there, you cannot get out of it, you have it now and forever, and you have to stand by it, 
even if you have not the same faith that I have in our religion. You are bound by it, and if you give it up, you are smashed to pieces. That is the life of our race, and that must be strengthened. You have withstood the shocks of centuries simply because you took great care of it, you sacrificed everything else for it. Your forefathers underwent everything boldly, even death itself, but preserved their religion. Temple altar temple was broken down by the foreign conqueror, but no sooner had the wave passed than the spire of the temple rose up again. Some of these old temples of southern India and those like Somnath of Gujarat will teach you volumes of wisdom, will give you a keener insight into the history of the race than any amount of books. Mark how these temples bear the marks of a hundred attacks and a hundred regenerations, continually destroyed and continually springing up out of the ruins, rejuvenated and strong as ever. That is the national mind, that is the national life current. Follow it and it leads to glory. Give it up and you die, death will be the only result, annihilation the only effect, the moment you step beyond that life current. I do not mean to say that other things are not necessary. I do not mean to say that political or social improvements are not necessary, but what I mean is this, and I want you to bear it in mind, that they are secondary here and that religion is primary. The Indian mind is first religious, then anything else. So this is to be strengthened, and how to do it, I will lay before you my ideas. They have been in my mind for a long time, even years before I left the shores of Madras for America, and that I went to America and England was simply for propagating those ideas. I did not care at all for the parliament of religions or anything else, it was simply an opportunity, for it was really those ideas of mine that took me all over the world. My idea is first of all to bring out the gems of spirituality that are stored up in our books and in the possession of a few only, hidden, as it were, in monasteries and in forests, to bring them out, to bring the knowledge out of them, not only from the hands where it is hidden, but from the still more inaccessible chest, the language in which it is preserved, the incrustation of centuries of Sanskrit words. In one word. I want to make them popular. I want to bring out these ideas and let them be the common property of all, of every man in India, whether he knows the Sanskrit language or not. The great difficulty in the way is the Sanskrit language, the glorious language of ours, and this difficulty cannot be removed until, if it is possible, the whole of our nation are good Sanskrit scholars. You will understand the difficulty when I tell you that I have been studying this language all my life, and yet every new book is new to me. How much more difficult would it then be for people who never had time to study the language thoroughly? Therefore the ideas must be taught in the language of the people, at the same time, Sanskrit education must go on along with it, because the very sound of Sanskrit words gives a prestige and a power and a strength to the race. The attempts of the great Ramanuj and of Chaitanya and of Kabir to raise the lower classes of India show that marvellous results were attained during the lifetime of those great prophets, yet the later failures have to be explained and cause shown why the effect of their teachings stopped almost within a century of the passing away of these great masters. The secret is here. They raised the lower classes, they had all the wish that these should come up, but they did not apply their energies to the spreading of the Sanskrit language among the masses. Even the great Buddha made one false step when he stopped the Sanskrit language from being studied by the masses. He wanted rapid and immediate results, and translated and preached in the language of the day, Pali. That was grand, he spoke in the language of the people, and the people understood him. That was great, it spread the ideas quickly and made them reach far and wide. But along with that, Sanskrit ought to have spread. 
नॉलेज केम बट द प्रेस्टीज वॉज नॉट देयर कल्चर वॉज नॉट देयर इट इज कल्चर दैट विद स्टैंड शॉक्स नॉट अ सिंपल मास ऑफ नॉलेज यू कैन पुट अ मास ऑफ नॉलेज इन टू द वर्ल्ड बट दैट विल नॉट डू इट मच गुड देयर मस्ट कम कल्चर इन टू द ब्लड वी ऑल नो इन मॉडर्न टाइम्स ऑफ नेशंस विच हैव मासिस ऑफ नॉलेज बट वॉट ऑफ देम दे आर लाइक टाइगर्स दे आर लाइक सैविजेस बिकॉज कल्चर इज नॉट देयर नॉलेज इज ओनली स्किन डीप एज सिविलाइजेशन इज एंड अ लिटल स्क्रैच ब्रिंग्स आउट द ओल्ड सैविज सच थिंग्स हैपन दिस इज द डेंजर टीच द मासिस इन द वर नेक्युलर्स गिव दैम आइडियाज दे विल गेट इन्फॉर्मेशन बट समथिंग मोर इज नेसेसरी गिव दैम कल्चर अंटिल यू गिव दैम दैट देयर कैन बी नो परमानेंस इन द रेज कंडीशन ऑफ द मासिस देयर विल बी अनदर कास्ट क्रिएटेड having the advantage of the sanskrit language which will quickly get above the rest and rule them all the same the only safety i tell you men who belong to the lower castes the only way to raise your condition is to study sanskrit and this fighting and writing and frothing against the higher castes is in vain it does no good and it creates fight and quarrel and this race unfortunately already divided is going to be divided more and more the only way to bring about the leveling of caste is to appropriate the culture the education which is the strength of the higher castes that done you have what you want in connection with this i want to discuss one question which it has a particular bearing with regard to madras there is a theory that there was a race of mankind in southern india called dravidians entirely differing from another race in northern india called the aryans and that the southern india brahmans are the only aryans that came from the north the other men of southern india belong to an entirely different caste and race to those of southern india brahmans now i beg your pardon mr philologist this is entirely unfounded the only proof of it is that there is a difference of language between the north and the south i do not see any other difference we are so many northern men here and i ask my european friends to pick out the northern and southern men from this assembly where is the difference a little difference of language but the brahmans are a race that came here speaking the sanskrit language well then they took up the dravidian language and forgot their sanskrit why should not the other castes have done the same why should not all the other castes have come one after the other from northern india taken up the dravidian language and so forgotten their own that is an argument working both ways do not believe in such silly things there may have been a dravidian people who vanished from here and the few who remained lived in forests and other places it is quite possible that the language may have been taken up but all these are aryans who came from the north the whole of india is aryan nothing else then there is the other idea that the shudra caste are surely the aborigines what are they they are slaves they say history repeats itself the americans english dutch and the portuguese got hold of the poor africans and made them work hard while they lived and their children of mixed birth were born in slavery and kept in that condition for a long period from that wonderful example the mind jumps back several thousand years and fancies that the same thing happened here and our archaeologist dreams of india being full of dark eyed aborigines and the bright aryan came from the lord knows where according to some they came from central tibet others will have it that they came from central asia there are patriotic englishmen who think that the aryans were all red haired others according to their idea think that they were all black haired if the writer happens to be a black haired man the aryans were all black haired of late There was an attempt made to prove that the Aryans lived on the Swiss lakes. 
I should not be sorry if they had been all drowned there, fury and all. Some say now that they lived at the North Pole. Lord bless the Aryans and their habitations. As for the truth of these theories, there is not one word in our scriptures, not one, to prove that the Aryan ever came from anywhere outside of India, and in ancient India was included Afghanistan. There it ends. And the theory that the Shudra caste were all non-Aryans, and they were a multitude, is equally illogical and equally irrational. It could not have been possible in those days that a few Aryans settled and lived there with a hundred thousand slaves at their command. These slaves would have eaten them up, made chutney of them in five minutes. The only explanation is to be found in the Mahabharata, which says that in the beginning of the Satya Yuga there was one caste, the Brahmans, and then by difference of occupations they went on dividing themselves into different castes. And that is the only true and rational explanation that has been given. And in the coming Satya Yuga all the other castes will have to go back to the same condition. The solution of the caste problem in India, therefore, assumes this form, not to degrade the higher castes, not to crush out the Brahman. The Brahmanhood is the ideal of humanity in India, as wonderfully put forward by Shankaracharya at the beginning of his commentary on the Gita, where he speaks about the reason for Krishna's coming as a preacher for the preservation of Brahmanhood, of Brahmanness. That was the great end. This Brahman, the man of God, he who has known Brahman, the ideal man, the perfect man, must remain, he must not go. And with all the defects of the caste now, we know that we must all be ready to give to the Brahmans this credit, that from them have come more men with real Brahmanness in them than from all the other castes. That is true. That is the credit due to them from all the other castes. We must be bold enough, must be brave enough to speak of their defects, but at the same time we must give the credit that is due to them. Remember the old English proverb, give every man his due. Therefore, my friends, it is no use fighting among the castes. What good will it do? It will divide us all the more, weaken us all the more, degrade us all the more. The days of exclusive privileges and exclusive claims are gone, gone forever from the soil of India and it is one of the great blessings of the British rule in India. Even to the Mohammedan rule we owe that great blessing, the destruction of exclusive privilege. That rule was, after all, not all bad, nothing is all bad, and nothing is all good. The Mohammedan conquest of India came as a salvation to the downtrodden, to the poor. That is why one-fifth of our people have become Mohammedans. It was not the sword that did it all. It would be the height of madness to think it was all the work of sword and fire. And one-fifth, one-half of your Madras people will become Christians if you do not take care. Was there ever a sillier thing before in the world than what I saw in Malabar country? The poor Pariya is not allowed to pass through the same street as the high caste man, but if he changes his name to a hodgepodge English name, it is all right or to a Mohammedan name, it is all right. What inference would you draw except that these Malabaris are all lunatics, their homes so many lunatic asylums, and that they are to be treated with derision by every race in India until they mend their manners and know better. Shame upon them that such wicked and diabolical customs are allowed, their own children are allowed to die of starvation, but as soon as they take up some other religion they are well fed. There ought to be no more fight between the castes. The solution is not by bringing down the higher, but by raising the lower up to the level of the higher. And that is the line of work that is found in all our books, in spite of what you may hear from some people whose knowledge of their own scriptures and whose capacity to understand the mighty plans of the ancients are only zero. 
they do not understand, but those do that have brains, that have the intellect to grasp the whole scope of the work. They stand aside and follow the wonderful procession of national life through the ages. They can trace it step by step through all the books, ancient and modern. What is the plan? The ideal at one end is the Brahman, and the ideal at the other end is the Chandala, and the whole work is to raise the Chandala up to the Brahman. Slowly and slowly you find more and more privileges granted to them. There are books where you read such fierce words as these. If the Shudra hears the Vedas, fill his ears with molten lead, and if he remembers a line, cut his tongue out. If he says to the Brahman, you Brahman, cut his tongue out. This is diabolical old barbarism no doubt, that goes without saying, but do not blame the lawgivers, who simply record the customs of some section of the community. Such devils sometimes arose among the ancients. There have been devils everywhere more or less in all ages. Accordingly, you will find that later on, this tone is modified a little, as for instance, do not disturb the Shudras, but do not teach them higher things. Then gradually we find in other Smritis, especially in those that have full power now, that if the Shudras imitate the manners and customs of the Brahmans they do well, they ought to be encouraged. Thus it is going on. I have no time to place before you all these workings, nor how they can be traced in detail, but coming to plain facts, we find that all the castes are to rise slowly and slowly. There are thousands of castes, and some are even getting admission into Brahmanhood, for what prevents any caste from declaring they are Brahmans? Thus caste, with all its rigour, has been created in that manner. Let us suppose that there are castes here with 10,000 people in each. If these put their heads together and say, We will call ourselves Brahmans, nothing can stop them, I have seen it in my own life. Some castes become strong and as soon as they all agree, who is to say nay? Because whatever it was, each caste was exclusive of the other. It did not meddle with others' affairs, even the several divisions of one caste did not meddle with the other divisions, and those powerful epoch-makers, Shankaracharya and others, were the great caste-makers. I cannot tell you all the wonderful things they fabricated, and some of you may recent what I have to say. But in my travels and experiences, I have traced them out, and have arrived at most wonderful results. They would sometimes get hordes of Baluchis and at once make them Kshatris, also get hold of hordes of fishermen and make them Brahmans forthwith. They were all rishis and sages, and we have to bow down to their memory. So, be you all rishis and sages, that is the secret. More or less we shall all be rishis. What is meant by a rishi? The pure one. Be pure first and you will have power. Simply saying, I am a Rishi, will not do, but when you are a Rishi you will find that others obey you instinctively. Something mysterious emanates from you, which makes them follow you, makes them hear you, makes them unconsciously, even against their will, carry out your plans. That is Rishihood. Now as to the details, they of course have to be worked out through generations. But this is merely a suggestion in order to show you that these quarrels should cease. Especially do I regret that in Muslim times there should be so much dissension between the castes. This must stop. It is useless on both sides, especially on the side of the higher caste, the Brahman, because the day for these privileges and exclusive claims is gone. The duty of every aristocracy is to dig its own grave, and the sooner it does so, the better. The more it delays, the more it will fester, and the worse death it will die. It is the duty of the Brahman, therefore, to work for the salvation of the rest of mankind in India. If he does that, 
and so long as he does that, he is a Brahman, but he is no Brahman when he goes about making money. You on the other hand should give help only to the real Brahman who deserves it, that leads to heaven. But sometimes a gift to another person who does not deserve it leads to the other place, says our scripture. You must be on your guard about that. He only is the Brahman who has no secular employment. Secular employment is not for the Brahman but for the other castes. To the Brahmans I appeal that they must work hard to raise the Indian people by teaching them what they know, by giving out the culture that they have accumulated for centuries. It is clearly the duty of the Brahmans of India to remember what real Brahmanhood is. As Manu says, all these privileges and honours are given to the Brahman, because with him is the treasury of virtue. He must open that treasury and distribute its valuables to the world. It is true that he was the earliest preacher to the Indian races. He was the first to renounce everything in order to attain to the higher realization of life before others could reach to the idea. It was not his fault that he marched ahead of the other caste. Why did not the other castes so understand and do as he did? Why did they sit down and be lazy and let the Brahmans win the race? But it is one thing to gain an advantage and another thing to preserve it for evil use. Whenever power is used for evil, it becomes diabolical, it must be used for good only. So this accumulated culture of ages of which the Brahman has been the trustee, he must now give to the people at large, and it was because he did not give it to the people that the Mohammedan invasion was possible. It was because he did not open this treasury to the people from the beginning, that for a thousand years we have been trodden under the heels of every one who chose to come to India. It was through that we have become degraded, and the first task must be to break open the cells that hide the wonderful treasures which our common ancestors accumulated, bring them out and give them to everybody, and the Brahman must be the first to do it. There is an old superstition in Bengal that if the cobra that bites, sucks out his own poison from the patient, the man must survive. Well then, the Brahman must suck out his own poison. To the non-Brahman castes I say, wait, be not in a hurry. Do not seize every opportunity of fighting the Brahman, because, as I have shown, you are suffering from your own fault. Who told you to neglect spirituality and Sanskrit learning? What have you been doing all this time? Why have you been indifferent? Why do you now fret and fume because somebody else had more brains, more energy, more pluck and go than you? Instead of wasting your energies in vain discussions and quarrels in the newspapers, instead of fighting and quarreling in your own homes, which is sinful, use all your energies in acquiring the culture which the Brahman has, and the thing is done. Why do you not become Sanskrit scholars? Why do you not spend millions to bring Sanskrit education to all the castes of India? That is the question. The moment you do these things, you are equal to the Brahman. That is the secret of power in India. Sanskrit and prestige go together in India. As soon as you have that, none dares say anything against you. That is the one secret, take that up. The whole universe, to use the ancient Advaitists' simile, is in a state of self-hypnotism. It is will that is the power. It is the man of strong will that throws, as it were, a halo round him and brings all other people to the same state of vibration as he has in his own mind. Such gigantic men do appear. And what is the idea? When a powerful individual appears, his personality infuses his thoughts into us and many of us come to have the same thoughts and thus we become powerful. Why is it that organizations are so powerful? Do not say organization is material. Why is it, to take a case in point, 
that 40 millions of Englishmen rule 300 millions of people here. What is the psychological explanation? These 40 millions put their wills together and that means infinite power and you 300 millions have a will each separate from the other. Therefore, to make a great future India, the whole secret lies in organization, accumulation of power, coordination of wills. Already before my mind rises one of the marvelous verses of the Rigveda Sanhita which says, Be thou all of one mind, be thou all of one thought. For in the days of yore, the gods being of one mind were enabled to receive oblations. That the gods can be worshipped by men is because they are of one mind. Being of one mind is the secret of society. And the more you go on fighting and quarrelling about all trivialities, such as Dravidian and Aryan, and the question of Brahmans and non-Brahmans and all that, the further you are off from that accumulation of energy and power which is going to make the future India. For mark you, the future India depends entirely upon that. That is the secret accumulation of willpower, coordination, bringing them all, as it here, into one focus. Each Chinman thinks in his own way, and a handful of Japanese all think in the same way, and you know the result. That is how it goes throughout the history of the world. You find in every case, compact little nations always governing and ruling huge unwieldy nations, and this is natural, because it is easier for the little compact nations to bring their ideas into the same focus, and thus they become developed. And the bigger the nation, the more unwieldy it is. Born, as it were, a disorganized mob, they cannot combine. All these dissensions must stop. There is yet another defect in us. Ladies, excuse me, but through centuries of slavery, we have become like a nation of women. You scarcely can get three women together for five minutes in this country or any other country, but they quarrel. Women make big societies in European countries and make tremendous declarations of women's power and so on. Then they quarrel, and some man comes and rules them all. All over the world they still require some man to rule them. We are like them. Women we are. If a woman comes to lead women, they all begin immediately to criticize her, tear her to pieces, and make her sit down. If a man comes and gives them a little harsh treatment, scolds them now and then, it is all right, they have been used to that sort of mesmerism. The whole world is full of such mesmerists and hypnotists. In the same way, if one of our countrymen stands up and tries to become great, we all try to hold him down, but if a foreigner comes and tries to kick us, it is all right. We have been used to it, have we not? And slaves must become great masters. So give up being a slave. For the next fifty years this alone shall be our keynote, this, our great mother India. Let all other vain gods disappear for the time from our minds. This is the only god that is awake, our own rays everywhere his hands, everywhere his feet, everywhere his ears, he covers everything. All other gods are sleeping. What vain gods shall we go after and yet cannot worship the god that we see all round us, the Virat? When we have worshipped this, we shall be able to worship all other gods. Before we can crawl half a mile, we want to cross the ocean like Hanuman. It cannot be. Everyone going to be a yogi, everyone going to meditate. It cannot be. The whole day mixing with the world with karma kanda, and in the evening sitting down and blowing through your nose. Is it so easy? Should rishis come flying through the air, because you have blown three times through the nose? Is it a joke? It is all nonsense. What is needed is chitta shuddhi, purification of the heart. And how does that come? The first of all worship is the worship of the Virat of those all around us. Worship it. 
worship is the exact equivalent of the Sanskrit word, and no other English word will do. These are all our gods, men and animals, and the first gods we have to worship are our countrymen. These we have to worship, instead of being jealous of each other and fighting each other. It is the most terrible karma for which we are suffering, and yet it does not open our eyes. Well, the subject is so great that I do not know where to stop, and I must bring my lecture to a close by placing before you in a few words the plans I want to carry out in Madras. We must have a hold on the spiritual and secular education of the nation. Do you understand that? You must dream it, you must talk it, you must think it's and you must work it out. Till then there is no salvation for the race. The education that you are getting now has some good points, but it has a tremendous disadvantage which is so great that the good things are all weighed down. In the first place it is not a man-making education, it is merely and entirely a negative education. A negative education or any training that is based on negation is worse than death. The child is taken to school and the first thing he learns is that his father is a fool, the second thing that his grandfather is a lunatic, the third thing that all his teachers are hypocrites, the fourth that all the sacred books are lies. By the time he is sixteen he is a mass of negation, lifeless and boneless. And the result is that fifty years of such education has not produced one original man in the three presidencies. Every man of originality that has been produced has been educated elsewhere and not in this country or they have gone to the old universities once more to cleanse themselves of superstitions. Education is not the amount of information that is put into your brain and runs riot there, undigested, all your life. We must have life-building, man-making, character-making assimilation of ideas. If you have assimilated five ideas and made them your life and character, you have more education than any man who has got by heart a whole library. The ass carrying its load of sandalwood knows only the weight and not the value of the sandalwood. If education is identical with information, the libraries are the greatest sages in the world and encyclopedias are the rishis. The ideal, therefore, is that we must have the whole education of our country, spiritual and secular, in our own hands and it must be on national lines, through national methods as far as practical. Of course, this is a very big scheme, a very big plan. I do not know whether it will ever work out. But we must begin the work. But how? Take Madras, for instance. We must have a temple, for with Hindus religion must come first. Then, you may say, all sects will quarrel about it. But we will make it a non-sectarian temple, having only Om as the symbol, the greatest symbol of any sect. If there is any sect here which believes that Om ought not to be the symbol, it has no right to call itself Hindu. All will have the right to interpret Hinduism, each one according to his own sect ideas, but we must have a common temple. You can have your own images and symbols in other places, but do not quarrel here with those who differ from you. Here should be taught the common grounds of our different sects, and at the same time the different sects should have perfect liberty to come and teach their doctrines, with only one restriction, that is, not to quarrel with other sects. Say what you have to say, the world wants it, but the world has no time to hear what you think about other people, you can keep that to yourselves. Secondly, in connection with this temple there should be an institution to train teachers who must go about preaching religion and giving secular education to our people, they must carry both. As we have been already carrying religion from door to door, let us along with it carry secular education also. That can be easily done. 
then the work will extend through these bands of teachers and preachers, and gradually we shall have similar temples in other places, until we have covered the whole of India. That is my plan. It may appear gigantic, but it is much needed. You may ask, where is the money? Money is not needed. Money is nothing. For the last twelve years of my life, I did not know where the next meal would come from, but money and everything else I want must come, because they are my slaves, and not I theirs, money and everything else must come. Must, that is the word. Where are the men? That is the question. Young men of Madras, my hope is in you. Will you respond to the call of your nation? Each one of you has a glorious future if you dare believe me. Have a tremendous faith in yourselves, like the faith I had when I was a child and which I am working out now. Have that faith, each one of you, in yourself, that eternal power is lodged in every soul and you will revive the whole of India. A. We will then go to every country under the sun, and our ideas will before long be a component of the many forces that are working to make up every nation in the world. We must enter into the life of every race in India and abroad, shall have to work to bring this about. Now for that, I want young men. It is the young, the strong, and healthy, of sharp intellect that will reach the Lord, say the Vedas. This is the time to decide your future, while you possess the energy of youth, not when you are worn out and jaded, but in the freshness and vigor of youth. Work, this is the time, for the freshest, the untouched, and unsmelled flowers alone are to be laid at the feet of the Lord, and such He receives. Rouse yourselves, therefore, or life is short. There are greater works to be done than aspiring to become lawyers and picking quarrels and such things. A far greater work is this sacrifice of yourselves for the benefit of your race, for the welfare of humanity. What is in this life? You are Hindus, and there is the instinctive belief in you that life is eternal. Sometimes I have young men come and talk to me about atheism. I do not believe a Hindu can become an atheist. He may read European books and persuade himself he is a materialist, but it is only for a time. It is not in your blood. You cannot believe what is not in your constitution. It would be a hopeless task for you. Do not attempt that sort of thing. I once attempted it when I was a boy, but it could not be. Life is short, but the soul is immortal and eternal, and one thing being certain, death, let us therefore take up a great ideal and give up our whole life to it. Let this be our determination, and may He, the Lord, who comes again and again for the salvation of His own people, to quote from our scriptures, may the great Krishna bless us and lead us all to the fulfillment of our aims.